Okay, cool. I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, I wanna say welcome and thank you to everybody for coming to our session. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about what's new and what's next in Fedora Core OS. Um, my name is Dusty, en Dust Ugh, Dusty Engineer. No, my name is Dusty Mabe. Uh, I'm an engineer at Red Hat. I uh, started at Red Hat in 2013 in consulting and then switched over to get my hands dirty in engineering in 2015. And I've been working on Atomic Host slash CoreOS stuff ever since. Um, before that, I was working at a telecom company uh, working on their CentOS Linux platform. Uh, and I'm joined today by Timothy Ravier. Timothy? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Timothy Ravier and I work uh, at Red Hat 2 in the CoreOS team essentially on Fedora CoreOS, and I also take part into the development of, of other RPMS3-based uh, system in the Fedora projects, so Silverblue and Fedora Kinoite too. Cool. Thanks, Timothy. Okay, we'll get started. What is our agenda for today? Uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about what is Fedora CoreOS. If you've been to a Fedora CoreOS talk before, that part might be a little repetitive, but bear with us. We'll then talk about what's new since last flock slash nest. Uh, so lots of stuff that we've been working on. Uh, we'll also talk about what is coming up soon in the next few months. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we wanna become a better Fedora project citizen and integrate more with the rest of Fedora. Um, so first, what is Fedora Core OS? Uh, so we've been in this state for a little while, but we call ourselves an emerging Fedora edition. Um, Fedora Core OS, at its inception came from two separate different communities. So on one side, we had uh, CoreOS, the company's container Linux project. Uh, and then we had Project Atomic from Red Hat and uh, the Atomic host, uh, you know, derivative from that, which we had Red Hat uh, or RHEL Atomic host. We had CentOS Atomic host and Fedora Atomic host. So uh, Fedora CoreOS is kind of the merging of container Linux and Fedora Atomic host. And from those two separate projects, we kind of you know, picked and choose or picked and chose uh, what we thought would, uh, you know, we wanted to keep from both. So from Container Linux, we kept the philosophy behind Container Linux, um, the provisioning stack and the cloud native expertise. And for Atomic Host, we kept the Fedora Foundation, uh, the update stack from Atomic Host being RPM OS tree. Uh, and then also we got enhanced security with SE Linux, which was not enabled in Container Linux. Um, so talking a little bit about the philosophy behind Fedora Core OS, a lot of this came from Container Linux. So it might not necessarily be what you are used to uh, in Fedora land. But uh, so one of the primary things that we try to highlight and emphasize is Fedora Core OS has automatic updates and we try to get people to leave them on. They are on by default. But what this means is that there is no interaction needed for administrators who are running Fedora Core OS systems to get security updates and bug fixes. Uh, by default, if they do nothing, their systems will update. Uh, this means they don't need to continuously check, you know, whether you know, a new CV is affecting them or whether, you know, something came out or whether the, the OS distribution vendor has shipped it yet. Uh, basically, it comes to them when it's ready. Uh, another thing that we like to emphasize is automated provisioning. So all nodes start from approximately the same starting point, whether you are in AWS, GCP, OpenStack, whether you're on bare metal, whether you're running on a Raspberry Pi, pretty much the image that you are starting with uh, for Fedora Core OS is going to be 99% the same everywhere. The only difference is really, uh, you know, we'll bake in some platform specific like IDs and stuff. Different platforms behave slightly differently. But other than that, it's the same image. What this means is uh, we have this provisioning infrastructure, I don't know what you want to call it, called Ignition that we use to provision a node. So you craft an ignition config, and we have a helper that helps you do that. And you essentially tell the, the node what you want it to do in life. If you want it to chew on data, that's fine. If you want it to host a web server, that's fine. If you want it to do something else, be a timer, that's fine. Uh, so you use ignition to provision a node on first boot. They all start from the same place. So whether you're running on a Raspberry Pi or in AWS, you can use that same ignition config. Um, and this kind of leads into a buzzy word called immutable infrastructure. And the, our spin on that here is 
you can automate your deployment and system configuration using Ignition. And then if you ever want to tweak something, you don't have to log into the node. You can, but you don't have to. You can, if it's cheap, to blow away a node and reprovision, then you can just blow that node away, update your configuration, commit it to Git, push it somewhere, and then reprovision it. Um, so that's really nice if you like to have a good idea that you know, you're always going to be able to start from scratch and get exactly what you want. And the last point on this slide is we try to encourage our users to run everything in containers. So they get the OS, they add their software on top, their software is running into containers. If they deliver all their library dependencies in a container, which is essentially what containers are, uh, then it makes the host updates more reliable. We don't ship an update to a library on the host that breaks their application, which means that they then are like, oh, well, the host update broke me, so I'm gonna disable automatic updates in the future. And now they're more susceptible to being out of date and uh, open to security issues. Uh, our supported platforms for Fedora Core OS, we have a lot. There's 10 plus ones on this page. Um, we are always trying to add new ones. Uh, we are directly launchable in AWS and GCP, and we'd like to add to that in the future so that you can just click and start Fedora Core OS. Um, we also have bare metal. So if you uh, want to install on bare metal, you can install via an ISO. That's a live environment. You can do uh, an automated or interactive installation to hard drive using that live environment, or you can choose that you just want to run from RAM, from memory, and run workloads that way if you'd like. Same thing for Pixie slash network boot. You can run live, you can install the disk. And we also have the option uh, for if you have a fancy new hard drive uh, running on a 4K native disk as well. Currently, we only uh, run on 64-bit Intel, um, but we are adding ARC64 support uh, to our release pipelines as well. It already works. It's just we don't build it and ship it regularly. So we are working on adding that, hopefully within the next month. Uh, and I'll let Timothy talk about what's new in Fedora Core OS. All right, so let's go with that. So we, yeah, I'm going to talk about what happened in Fedora Core OS land since uh, approximately August 2020, so about a year ago. So let's go. Next slide, please. So the first one of the first big change we've made is that we finally moved to Cgroup v2 by default for Fedora Core OS. So we switched with the version that is written there on the slide uh, by default, which means all new nodes starting from this version will be running Cgroups v2 by default. Uh, we were able to make that with the Fedora 34 switch essentially because now we have full support in Podman and Docker. So whether you're running Podman or Docker, you can have that work. Uh, no, no privilege here. Um, the, the main thing to remember with this switch is that we cannot auto update nodes by default. So there's no automatic updates from V1 to V2 on the nodes because you need to recreate your containers. The container runtimes are not able to move from one to the other automatically. So you have to do that manually, make the switch. To switch a system, you can use the command that is uh, just written below. And, uh, and all the, all the, the examples are uh, into the, the doc. So on each slide, you will get sometimes some, some comments here. And uh, at, the, at the bottom, I'm linking to the specific page in the documentation, which is related to the content of the slide. So yeah, next slide, please. All right, so on top of the group V2 changes, we added new features to RPM3, which enables you to do uh, reliable live changes on the system. So sometimes it's useful. We 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 know we call Fedora Core OS an immutable operating system, but it's not immutable in the sense yet that you cannot change it. It's immutable in the sense that you control or it gets changed and when it gets changed. And that's the idea here. So we have several commands in our RPM tree now, which enables you to do changes on the system live in a reliable and safe way. So the first one that you may already be familiar with is RPM S3 user overlay. Uh, essentially, what this does is this creates an overlay, uh, a temporary uh, file system that is mounted on top of slash user and enables you to do any modification you want to do on the system, on slash user, which is usually mounted as read only on Fedora Core And this overlay is mounted as read write, so you're free to do any changes. Of course, you have to be root, but you're free to do any changes, and it's non persistent. So that's like the basics. But 
if we want to go a little bit further, we have the, the new command, uh, which essentially install packages live on a system. So the idea is that you uh, you would call RPM3 install, uh, for example, stress if you want to debug something on your system, and you can have this apply live option to apply the changes directly. What this will do is it will create a new deployment, just like we do for all RPM3 install commands. When you overlay a package on the system, it won't directly impact the running system. It will create a new deployment for you to use on the next boot. But with this supply live option, uh, what you get essentially at the end is RPM3 will switch atomic atomically the running system to this new deployment, and you will be able to use a new package. So you will be able to run a stress to debug your image. Uh, the main benefit here is with that is it's perfectly safe because uh, your system will still be fully read-only, slash user will be read-only, and on the next boot you will you will get the new the new image with S3 still applied. This was introduced in in, in two versions of RPM3, which are linked below with uh, the full documentation again below. Next slide, please. All right, so. On top of that, uh, we've added some new features in addition. So the first one I want to talk about is kernel arguments. So we, we've added support in Ignition to directly set, change, modify, or remove kernel arguments uh, on, on, on Fedora Core S nodes. So usually when you boot your system first, you, you would have to either do that manually or do some, some little bit of uh, hacky changes in, in your configs. Uh, it's not fully supported in Ignition. So with one single option, you can do that change kernel arguments on all the platforms with the same way in the same in the same manner in the ignition config. Uh, so this change, of course, is applied on first boot and uh, as it changes kernel argument, changes all the way the kernel behaves. Uh, the kernel will we, we will reboot to get the new uh, arguments applied to the kernel. So below I've added two examples here. Uh, the first one, uh, so those examples are butane configs. So. Uh, if you don't know about butane, the short version, that's it's a nice way to write configs, then that gets converted to ignition, which is something that is consumed by the machine, by the Fedora Chorus nodes, but it's much nicer to write butane configs uh, to get ignition configs then after. So those are two butane configs here, which give you examples of um, uh, what kind of kernel arguments you can change. Uh, so the first one is about removing some of the uh, mitigations for the CPU vulnerabilities. So say Spectre, Meltdown, you might have heard of them. And if you want to get full performance on your node, you might use them. Uh, and the second one is if you're stuck on C groups V1 for any reason, uh, then you can still do that and we had the option to, to, to stay on V1. Next slide. All right, um, the next, uh, and I want to introduce bootupd. So what was bootupd? Well, essentially, we uh, we created a, a, a new a new software, a new piece of uh, software uh, to to perform updates, to update the bootloaders on RPM3 based systems. So right now, it's only used in Fedora Crest, and it only supports UEFI boots and UEFI systems. Uh, and, but we are planning for, for, for support for, for BIOS systems too. So why would we have to do that? Well, the thing is making actual bootloader updates transactional and doing that in a safe way is really, really, really hard. So it's not something like we, we can really easily solve. And that's why that something that wasn't solved by OS3 and Apple MS3 in a sense, uh, they don't touch bootloaders. They just, you just install a system and then OS3 and Apple MS3 will not update it. It won't touch it. So we need something else. Uh, so the idea is essentially we don't know. We don't know when it is actually safe to perform a bootloader update on the system because the power might get cut. The yeah, the power go, might go out. You might reboot your system or things like that, and it's extremely hard to know. So the idea is we let you do it. We let you tell bootupd to when it's safe to actually perform the update on the system, and so users can manually trigger that uh, and, and update the bootloaders. Uh, so the, the command to update is fairly simple. It's boot up CDL update, and uh, you just instantly, instantaneously get the new version. All right, next slide. Um, another change we've had it is uh, alongside a little bit of a bootloaders closer. Uh, it's uh, we've now made slash boot read only on Fedora nodes, Fedora Core S nodes by default. So the idea is that 
modifying contents written in slash boot is discouraged because it's already handled automatically by RPMO stream mostly and uh, and bootup for for some things. Uh, so the the, the first thing is usually when you go into slash boot and you want to change things is for two reasons. Either you want to add or remove kernel kind of arguments to, to deployments to, to your to your, for your kernels. So the safe way to do that is on Fedora request to do that with RPM3 key args, and then you do all the commands to remove add arguments. Or you might want to change which version of Fedora Core you want to boot by default. So either you want to go back to the previous version, or you want to deploy a specific version to test or to find a fix or something like that, or you either want to update. And changing the order uh, on which uh, the boot order is uh, safely done via RPM Suite 2. All right, next slide, please. Uh, a new one of the other features we've added um, recently in Ignition is full support for encrypted storage using Lux. So Lux is essentially a way to pick up a device and say oh, to the and tell to the kernel this device is fully encrypted, and and, and, uh, and nothing uh, can be read from it without the key, the correct key. Um, we support a couple of mechanisms to unlock uh, Lux devices. The first one is the classic key file. So you either have, you, you write a string or a long string or a binary uh, into uh, to a file and you use that to unlock a device. Uh, or you can use Tang uh, or Tang server or, or TPM2 uh, unlocking mechanisms. And both of those are um, enabled through Clevis, which is another software uh, we, we include in Fedora Quest now. So, on top of that, we've added support for making sure that you can also run the root partition encrypted using Lux. So this requires that you use either TPM2 or Tang uh, to unlock the partition, because of course, if you want to unlock this partition, the setup has to be automated because your node will boot up directly and you have to unlock the partition automatically. So here below are two examples of configs. Uh, the first one uh, is about slash for TPM2 using Lux, and the other one uh, Lux for another partition on the system. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, third feature we've added in Ignition is RAID support. So you can set up any kind of RAID array uh, on first boot via Ignition. What this will do is this will manage all the setup of the boot partition, the ESP, and things like that. And uh, this will do all that for you and set up the RAID arrays for boot up uh, for your system. Um, one of the side effects of this change is that we no longer uh, either mount the UEFI partition or the UEFI system partition by default. So you won't be able to see anything in slash boot slash UEFI because uh, we don't want that anywhere anymore. Uh, the two examples here are about RAID 1 and RAID 0. So the first one is about mirroring the full boot disk. So you, if you've got two devices and you want to make sure your system is uh, safe, uh, if you lost one, then you can go with RAID 1. And on the other side, if you want to go faster, more performance, you can go with RAID 0 and strip the data on two devices. Next slide, please. And finally, We've added some uh, more option to allow you to uh, more flexibility when you're booting using the IPC or PXC mechanism. So this is for booting nodes on the network, via the network, uh, either booting nodes that are transient. So we say that they are they don't persist. Or if you want to install nodes on, on systems uh, using IPC, you can use that too. Uh, so the idea is when you boot a system via, via IPXE, uh, you provide, you're, you're giving the target system a kernel, a unit RAM FS, and final root FS to, to use for, for the system. Uh, and the, yeah, the final system needs all that. And all those files needs to, both of the unit RAM FS and the root FS need, used to be included in the same file. And that's no longer the case because sometimes it's useful to split them up for performance reasons. So you might want IPC by itself sometimes is slow or, or can be slow, and you wanna might want to do this in separate steps to get to get things more performing. Uh, so yeah, this gives you flexibility because now you can do three those this three in, in three different ways. So the first one is to say, okay, I'm providing the kernel and the init reference, which are rather small uh, via IPC. 
and then the system itself will download the rootfs over the network um, and you have to specify the url where the rootfs is with a kernel arguments that you specify new pxc config the second install option are going in a sense back to how it was before uh, the first one is say okay or, or, or instead of providing just one init RD, we're essentially providing two and uh, the, the init RMFS and the rootfs and this will be given directly to the booted system. And the, the final one is if you can only specify one uh, init RD, you can uh, concatenate the rootfs and the init RMFS and provide that directly to the nodes. Uh, all right, and that's it for uh, pixie boxing, pixie booting. Uh, and that's about what we have been the main, you know, like the highlights of what we've done uh, the last year for on Fedora CoreOS. Uh, and uh, now we're going to talk about a little bit of the things that we are focusing on uh, that are probably coming in the first in in, in the coming months. Uh, of course, we don't have like specific timelines, but those features are other really advanced, mostly mostly done or, or in, in, in later stages of development, and are really likely to like land in Fedora CoreOS soon. Um, so the first one is about count me support. So this one is mostly done. Uh, and we are going to enable that in the coming weeks. Uh, essentially, it's a way to enable a really privacy preserving way to count systems. So it enables us to have a view of how many systems, uh, the, how many federal request nodes have been uh, started and running uh, in, in the world, in a sense. Um, the, the idea is that this takes really, really great care into preserving user privacy. And we make a uh, really great care into make sure that we don't send any specific data on any about any systems. And so what this actually sends is only about a very large, very wide approximation of how long you've been running a node. So if it's either something between one week or something between six months and one year or things like that, and it's very, very broad. Uh, with this, this counting system only reaches out to official Fedora uh, Fed repository servers. So you're not, we're not interested in introducing something new. It's already the, the official infrastructure. And yeah, and we don't send anything else. So, and of course, you can always disable that if you, if you must. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> if you were wondering where CoreOS was on the slides that Matt, Matthew Miller had earlier today, where he reports, you know, usage information and stuff like that. CoreOS wasn't there because we don't have it enabled by default yet. We sent a um, an email earlier this year and an announcement on the Fedora magazine about when we are going to enable it, and we are almost there. So we're enabling it later this month. But it's the same exact um, metric system that's used for the rest of Fedora. Definitely. Um, so. One other thing that is bugging us in a sense for a while is that we've uh, we've kept, unfortunately, we've had IP tables still uh, blocked, we, we, could, we could say, on the legacy backend uh, instead of the new NF table once uh, into Fedora CoS node. It wasn't something we did intentionally, but unfortunately, it's a consequence of a bug in the uh, the way alternatives, the alternatives command work and how it's set up on systems. Um, and so, yeah, essentially, we still by default using the legacy backend, but we are planning on switching to the new NF tables backend. Uh, so, so that everybody can benefit from that, just like the rest of Fedora. All right, so the details by themselves of why this doesn't work are a little bit boring and are due to incompatibilities with all the alternative, which is a ground all command from the Unix times work, and uh, which isn't really compatible with all RPM history itself function. Uh, so yeah, the thing is, the, the nice thing is, it's really easy to work around. Essentially, it's writing some same links and you're done, and it's uh, and there you go. You 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 work around the issue, but we of course we want to make something like nicer, but it's still work in progress on that front. All right, next slide, please. The third item is about systemd resolve d. So we enabled systemd resolve d by default uh, in Fedora with uh, Fedora with the move to Fedora so default to side the rest of Fedora. But the thing is, we found some issue uh, with a usage in some some contexts in some cases. So we had to disable some part of it. So we had to disable sub listener because we had issue with reverse DNS lookups uh, and and well cascading 
uh, things of issues. Uh, the the main the main thing here is that the issue itself is resolved. We we worked around uh, it with uh, working with the network manager team to make sure this worked correctly on fair request with the use case uh, we found. Uh, but the fix itself will only be available only be available in Fedora 35. So we have to wait until uh, we rebase and until Fedora 35 is, is released and we rebase to that to get the full fix and enable SMD result D fully uh, on the node. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got two ideas that are floating around that we're working on to change a little bit of things uh, around uh, our PMS3 about how well, we overwork on the system. So the first one is about OS3 commits in container images. So the main idea is that now with, with our PMS3 uh, and, and OS3 extensions, you can export OS3 commits inside a format that is suited, well suited to put into container images. And this essentially gives you a little bit of tweaked container images that you can use to rebase your system to. So you can, from a live running chorus node, uh, rebase to a new version from a container image that distributes OS3 commits inside container images. This also enables you to run, essentially, a version of Fedora chorus, just like you would run a container. So it just works. Essentially, just what you just have to provide, like the command to run inside the node. Uh, well, not really a node, but now it's a container. Uh, and uh, it's really great for debugging, testing, figure out uh, what's in a specific version or things like that. And, and uh, yeah, this is a, it's kind of like a, a feature preview about what's coming up. We are, we are not yet releasing those container images, but we've added support for that and we're working on, on figure out how to enable that. Um, the final last thing about this is that. It's not meant as a, a base image for writing application containers. You can still use the Fedora uh, RPM classic uh, base image, which is much better and much smaller because those images are something like 100, uh, 700 megabytes uh, because they have the full curve, full curve Fedora chorus node, essentially. And finally, the last uh, uh, thing we have, next slide please, the last option we've added is uh, CLI wrap, which is essentially a wrapper for command commands that you might run on a node and you want to make sure. Uh, and the, the idea is that you might not might forget whether or not you're running a Fedora chorus node, whether or not you're in a container or a toolbox, and you might try and install an RPM, for example. And if you do that on Fedora Chorus node right now, you get some cryptic error message because the RPM itself is not aware that you're running on a, on a lockdown system. Uh, so here the idea with RPM3 is that we're replacing, we're wrapping those commands and give you, giving you its ints instead, instead of errors, error message to help you push into the right direction. So if you want to install a package on the system, it will explain that to you how to do that via RPM3 install itself. So yeah, it's an help, uh, an help mechanism to help you transition from classic Fedora to those systems. And optionally, uh, you can enable that optionally uh, via OS3 deploy. And uh, it's, it's currently uh, an experimental option. And that's it for me. Uh, that's it for like the features that are coming like really soon and how let the see and the, the, uh, the, the part about, okay, what do we do with uh, the rest of Fedora and how we interact with that. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about uh, becoming a better Fedora project citizen is how I've titled this. Um, and first, I will dig into a little bit of context for where we are today and what we've been up to. Uh, so the background context is uh, I mentioned earlier that Fedora Core OS essentially was the combination of uh, Container Linux and Atomic Host. So Container Li Linux had an installer, Atomic Host had an installer, Container Linux had a network stack, Atomic Host had a network stack, Container Linux had a container runtime, Atomic Host had a container runtime. Uh, so there was a lot of different things that needed to be resolved between, you know, lessons learned from each project, what we liked about each one, what we didn't like about each one. We liked Container Linux's Ignition. We liked Atomic Host's RPM OS tree, um, things like that. There was a lot of work that went into deciding what we wanted Fedora Core OS to look like, and there was a lot of pressure to get something out the door early. Um, so we 
basically did all those decisions up front, shipped something, and then we worked to knock down all of the technical debt associated with, you know, getting it out early. Um, so there was a lot that went into deciding what we wanted Fedora Core OS to look like. Uh, another thing is Fedora Core OS is also the basis for upstream and downstream OpenShift, uh, which is a very fast moving project in and of itself. Uh, and there's a lot of requirements, uh, you know, or needs, features, new features that come in, um, especially in the container runtime space for uh, things in OpenShift. So we, we need to be conscious all the time of uh, shipping new features for, for upstream OKD and OCP. Uh, another thing is Fedora Core OS follows a different release model than what, what you might be used to in the rest of Fedora. So we release uh, three different streams, stable testing and next, every two weeks. So we do three releases every two weeks, and sometimes we do more than that if we find issues or security issues come out. Uh, so we're pretty much always releasing, uh, which is kind of you know demanded that we uh, develop some custom uh, tooling for ourselves to be able to achieve those goals. Um, so in that same vein, Fedora OS has a heavy reliance on CI and speed. Um, so releasing multiple streams every two weeks means that we pretty much have to rely on automated tests. There is no way that we can release three different streams every two weeks and possibly more than every two weeks uh, if issues arise if we don't trust our automated tests. Um, so we run CI on pretty much every PR that comes in and every pipeline run that goes through. Um, so this allows us to essentially let robots do a lot of the work that we have manual would have had people manually running uh, previously. Uh, the other point in there is basically the OpenShift release cadence is much faster than RHEL. Um, so that means that we need to be able to get features into uh, to Fedora Core OS and downstream into Red Hat Core OS a lot faster a lot of times than what uh, might be used to. Uh, in you know other Fedora project alternatives, um, this you know all this kind of boils down into we needed custom release tooling in order to help us achieve those goals. Uh, so what we've done is we've done put a lot of work into building pipelines that can run many times a day and also run all of those tests that I mentioned earlier that essentially test every little piece of Fedora Core OS, the installer. Uh, the different various hardware platforms um, in the clouds and all that, and let us know what's failing and what's not. Um, and we also wanted to, you know, be able to quickly develop uh, Fedora Core OS so that we could get feedback very fast. So we built a containerized development environment called Core OS Assembler, and it allows anybody that has, you know, Linux with Podman and KVM to quickly and easily build, run, and test any Fedora Core OS artifact that we ship. Uh, so you don't need special access um, to infrastructure. You don't need anything. You don't need a complicated setup. Uh, you should just be able to run it with Podman and a nice little bash alias that runs Core OS Assembler for you. Uh, so all of that background was to say that's what we've been up to, that we've been building out uh, the infrastructure and features and now we're getting to a point where we can kind of run a little bit. All of that stuff is working, you know, like a well-oiled machine. And we can start to be a little more proactive in the Fedora community and talk about the changes that are coming in and have discussions appropriately there. So that's one of the first things that we've started doing recently is actively reviewing Fedora change requests during the development release cycle. Um, and having conversations within our community about what we think affects Fedora Core OS or what doesn't, and how do we address those things, right? Some things we need to go back and talk to, uh, you know, talk on the change request uh, development discussion about. Some things, is, you know, will be things that we need to do internally. Some things will be things that, you know, we don't need to do anything for. We just automatically are able to absorb the change. Um, so for this release cycle, we have a Fedora 35 changes label in our issue tracker. And basically, uh, every issue that we decided, oh, this needs more investigation, we created an individual issue for it, and we have discussion there and investigation in that ticket. Uh, the other thing that we started doing recently was building and testing against a rawhide stream of Fedora Core OS. So the rawhide stream is not intended to be a stream that people use. 
it's strictly just for you know re, you know finding problems and fixing issues. Um, but what this means is our suite of automated tests now complement Rawhide. Every time Punji runs and a new Rawhide um, you know repo is created with new content, new RPMs uh, that are in the content set, we create Fedora Core OS based on that. And if things break, we investigate. Uh, we report issues upstream or and or we just fix them and um, you know we participate a little more closer upstream with the maintainers and developers of those respective packages. Uh, what's really nice about this as well is we can also pin so if a package comes in and breaks us we we don't just you know leave that package we can pin on the older version of the package and uh, continue to test against new versions of Rawhide until that issue gets fixed um, for us. So we can continue to uh, move and not just get broken on a single package. Uh, another thing that we'd like to do is take more, uh, take a more active role in discussion and participation in FESCO. Um, so participating in the FESCO discussions will allow us to get advanced knowledge of future changes and allow us to help influence and add perspective on how changes that are coming down the, the line, you know, might affect Fedora Core OS users. So taking part in that discussion means we get ahead of the ball rather than behind it. Um, another thing that's optional that I've been thinking about is, you know, having a Fedora Core OS representative possibly run for FESCO and be a member of that um, board. Uh, the other thing that we've been discussing lately is changing our default policy for for configuration. So the background here is there's been some friction between, uh, you know, leading edge Fedora changes and Kubernetes required defaults. So if you don't know, one of the target use cases for Fedora Core OS is being able to run Kubernetes on top. Um, so Fedora is nice, leading edge, very good, but sometimes Kubernetes has a little bit of a conflict with that in that it's not necessarily ready yet. C groups V2 was an example. Another example I have on this slide is swap on ZRAM, where you know the Fedora change came in, so now we have swap on ZRAM, which means you know even if you don't configure a swap device, you still get swap. Okay, Kubernetes just doesn't support swap. It, it'll see that swap exists and it'll just you know not even run unless you change a, a flag and say yes, please run. Uh, but in general, it doesn't support swap. There's been like a feature request upstream. Uh, that's been accepted and it's going to happen soon, but it just doesn't. So that was an example where there was a Fedora change that came in, but we weren't able to absorb it because of uh, you know one of our target platforms. What we are doing now is we're changing our policy such that we're able to apply those Fedora changes as they come in and add good documentation for Kubernetes distributors who are going to be running an ignition config anyway to provision Kubernetes on the platform to add, you know, hey, you're gonna be provisioning Kubernetes anyway, add this little bit because, you know, for example, here, Kubernetes doesn't support swap yet, et cetera. In the future, we'd like to gate these changes with something like a feature flags implementation where users can easily, rather than, you know, copying, pasting a lot of configuration change, they'll just copy and paste a small little snippet of like enable these feature flags and then, uh, you know, then they'll be good to go. So this is an example where in the past we were a little more, uh, a little less flexible with regards to some uh, Fedora changes. We're getting to the point where we're a little more flexible and can stay in line with Fedora a little better. Uh, the other point that I wanted to mention here is closer, you know, having a closer proximity to Fedora major releases. The, I, I combined this into, or separated this into two separate slides. The first one here, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about our stream process and how we do promotions. Um, so I'm gonna talk about testing and stable. Uh, in this case, basically what we do with our testing stream is we snapshot RPM content on a particular day and we build a testing stream release out of that and we release it. Um, so users who are following testing will get uh, the testing stream release on this date. Uh, and then if, you know, everything is good in that content set, two weeks later, um, our stable stream will get that content. So the takeaway from this slide is essentially testing comes out. If everything is good, two weeks later, stable gets promoted to that same content set. 
Um, and that kind of leads me into how do we behave during uh, Fedora's major rebase? We've gotten a, a bit of criticism about like, oh, well, Fedora 34 is GA. Why isn't Fedora Core OS, um, you know, stable on Fedora 34 content yet? And it has to do with automatic updates, right? We want to essentially make sure that we try not to break people as much as possible so that they will stay on automatic updates. We don't necessarily want people manually updating their systems because then they get out of date and our model kind of goes out the door. So what we've got right now uh, for Fedora you know, GA and switching over our streams is what I've got on the screen, screen right here. And I'll go over that in just a second, but I want to emphasize that this is just what we have right now. We want to get a little closer to um, you know, having stable over on you know, closer to GA release, uh, but we're just kind of tweaking this process as we go, and this is what we've got right now. So at the time of Fedora beta release, our next stream is switched over to the new Fedora release. So in this next cycle on Fedora beta, the next stream will be on Fedora 35 content. At the point of Fedora final freeze, we're gonna start updating our next stream every week instead of every two weeks. So it cl more closely tracks GA content every week that there is a no-go and Ben Cotton dies a little bit inside of himself. Uh, we will still do a release to that next stream uh, to you know, closely track that GA content set. On GA date, so Fedora GA, uh, Fedora Core S will reorient itself and its release schedule um, starting on that day. So usually on a Tuesday, we'll start over. So week zero that day, we'll do a triple release, but the important part is next, our next stream will be that latest Fedora 35 content. Um, so that will be what gets released GA. One week later, assuming nobody reports, hey, this broke everything in the world for me. Uh, our testing release will be promoted from that previous next content. So the GA content will be in testing. And then the standard two weeks after that, the stable release will be um, the GA content. So stable three weeks after GA will now be fully rebased to Fedora uh, 35. That's where we are right now. We'd like to improve in the future, um, but we're gonna tweak it slowly to just be a little more conservative. Okay, so that's it uh, for us for now. Obviously more discussions to be had about becoming better Fedora citizens. Um, I'll stop and check to see what we have as far as questions. If we have a lot of questions, we'll just go there. If we don't have many questions, then uh, we will just dig in and maybe do a demo or something. We have a couple of questions. Okay, um, cool. Some were answered partially in the chat, I think, so we can, uh, but we can give it a short, uh, short try. So, one of uh, the first coming, first one to come in was how to handle persistent data in Fedora Cross. Do you want to take it or go? Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. So. Um... I guess it depends a little bit on exactly what you're talking about, but if you, you know, when you boot Fedora Core OS, uh, obviously there are parts of the operating system that are read only, which means you can't write anything to it. If you want to write data, so a lot of times your applications will have data themselves that they want to, um, you know, s store or state that they want to store, then a lot of uh, people will write things under var, which is read write. Um, if you want that to persist over a reboot, that's fine. VAR does that automatically. If you want that to persist over a reprovision, uh, meaning you know, you've know you got a system up and you want to reprovision it, but you want to keep your data, uh, what you can do is have that slash VAR or anything really be a separate file system and you can write things there instead. And then on the reprovision, essentially you'll, you would tell Ignition, hey, I want a file system at this location. And, um, and you can, uh, when it runs, it'll say, oh, there's a file system that already exists at that location and you didn't tell me to override it. So I'm gonna leave it alone. Uh, so that's how you would handle persistent data. If, uh, you, know, if you want it to, to stay across reprovisioning, then you just make it a separate file system. Great. Thanks, Leslie. Um, the second question was about 
does Cores have an Excel event session or a graphical interface? And I'll take this one because <laughs> it's, it's, it's on my side, I would say. Uh, so no, we don't have a graphical interface because it's mostly a server-oriented operating system. So you run that on servers or in the cloud. And if you want a graphical interface or graphical uh, desktop-oriented versions, you probably should look at Fedora Silverblue or Fedora Kinoite, which are more desktop-oriented. Uh, but very similar because they use the same kind of technology underneath. All right, the next question is about, are there any plans to integrate the apply live functionality with GNF so that people can operate with their existing muscle memory? And uh, yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna take that one? I mean, that's kind of like the CLI wrap type. Yeah, all right. Uh, so yeah, it's essentially the idea is to provide hints. Uh, so switching completely like so integrating with dnf i i, I don't know uh, because dnf operates like directly on on the on the file systems um so the idea here is is more about integration into our premise tree um how we do that we will see live wrap is a bit uh, is is always a little bit difficult because um if as we want ever have the full set of DNF functionality if we pretend to be like the full DNF command, but don't actually support all the options. It's a weird uh, user interface, weird user experience. Uh, and so, yeah, so far we've taken the side of saying, yeah, we don't support all the options. We are just giving you hints if you run that interactively. Otherwise we, we are out. If, if you run that as part of a script, it will just give you an error. All right, the next question is about the size of the QEMU KVM image and Fedora Quest, which is rather large, uh, 1.5 gigabytes uh, compared to Fedora Cloud. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one thing about Fedora Quest is we try to deliver, we do try to deliver the same image everywhere. Um, that just, it really helps out a lot from a, uh, <laughs> from a perspective of, confusion, especially for, for us as well. But the thing about that is Fedora Cloud's able to get away with targeting a cloud environment. So a VM type situation, they don't have to really support that many different types of hardware, right? Um, so one thing that we have to do is to, you know, ship all the kernel modules and a lot of firmware that they don't have to. Uh, I will admit that, um, you know, there are, you know, in Fedora Cloud, we don't have container run times. Container run times are kind of heavy. Um, and they're built in Golang, statically compiled for the most part. And, uh, and so we have a couple of different things in Fedora Core OS that are quite large, unfortunately. Um, I would love to get them down, <laughs> uh, but I don't have any, any, I don't know of any plans right now to do that. I don't think, Timothy, you probably don't either, right? <laughs> yeah, it's essentially what I wrote as, a, as an answer. So yeah, bear line here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, uh, but but we're always open to yep. you know ideas. If we have creative yep. ways to like not necessarily remove uh, you know functionality that we have, because like one thing is if we remove all the hardware support, then you know now we've got several different images that we're shipping and stuff like that, and it, it really keeps the mental model easy when you are shipping the same image everywhere. Um, so there are some drawbacks to that. All right. Uh, so we are on at the 15 minute mark, so we can maybe, I don't know if we should go on, we can still go on into one or two questions, but, uh, yeah, let's just keep going with questions for the next five. Um, so one next question is about, uh, container management tools that we have available in Fedora Cross. So I don't know if you could specify a question more because essentially we ship Podman, Scopeo, and Docker with by default with Fedora Chorus. If you need something else, uh, then feel free to write a suggestion because I don't know exactly yeah. what the question. I is think about. I think I might. Uh, I don't know. I see I see his question and I kind of have an idea because I have a similar problem. Uh, so he said, for example, uh, automatic rebuild of Podman containers. Uh, and I've solved this problem by just using systemd units um, with the timers. And so periodically, uh, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you, you just set your container up so it builds in a registry um, and periodically does that. And then when you run your container, just set it up to pull periodically or something like that or pull always. Uh, I, for some reason, 
want to build my containers on that system and then run them there and not store them in a registry. Sometimes I have secrets in there that I don't necessarily, I don't know. Anyway, I see, I see your use case. And at least what I've done today is I have uh, implemented systemd timers and services to just rebuild periodically. Uh, I don't know if Podman somehow has uh, inherent ability to say, oh, this image hasn't been built recently, rebuild it. Um, but yeah, that's something to look into. So I, I do, it's, it's nice because I do the other side. So essentially I build my containers in Quay and I have them auto rebuild them in Quay when I commit to a repo. And then I pull them using Podman pool uh, on the nodes. And uh, you can have Podman use the auto update feature, which is like pitches regularly. Uh, if, and sees if there's a new container, if there's a new container under the registry, we'll try and pull it and update your container. Yep. Yeah. And if you don't know, Quay, I think is pretty much free. So you can, you can sign up and they'll host your containers for you and stuff. So if there's nothing secret in there. That's yeah. an option. No limits uh, for public repository. All right. Uh, next question is about how is Fedora conflicting with Kubernetes? I think that might be uh, part of what I said earlier. Basically, I, I was saying the Fedora leading edge Sometimes the brand new defaults that come in, you know, some applications or projects aren't necessarily ready for them yet. Uh, and uh, it takes them a little while to say, okay, this change in system D upstream, let me take advantage of that. Or let me be able to at least not break when, when I see that. Uh, so that's, it, well, that's what I was implying. Basically, sometimes Fedora is a little too early for, for some applications uh, that exist. Um, I wasn't trying to imply that Fedora is, you know, is inherently conflict, conflicting with Kubernetes. Yeah. And the last question we have is about wondering if we can use a new feature to export OS3 commits to container image in other desktop variants, such as Silverblue and Kinoite, especially to rebuild the workstation from the scratch. Um, so yeah, we're still working in, in like ironing out all the issues with that, but we could potentially, yeah, move to that. This would require that, um, um, well, the, so this two side of this, it's from the first part is like, it's purely a distribution mechanism in a sense. So it's shipping the same content that you usually ship via OS3 repo. Instead of shipping it and via classic file server, you ship it by a container image, but it's still the same content. Uh, yeah, so I, I, the takeaway there is the, putting them in a container image isn't really that interesting unless you were trying to uh, you know, mirror infrastructure and deliver OS tree updates yourself. Um, so as a user, you probably shouldn't really care if we're using traditional OS tree backend or a container registry as a backend for, uh, you know, for silver blue or for door core OS updates. However, if you are somebody who's trying to like set up an offline disconnected environment and you want to uh, ship Fedora core OS or ship Fedora Silver Blue to your users, um, then you might be interested. You might already have a container registry that you've got containers in, and just putting uh, these payloads in the container registry is easier for you than setting up an OS tree uh, server to do the OS tree part in containers. Yeah, definitely. Then it's it's more like focused on how we ship things. The the rebuild thing is. Uh, yeah, the, this image in a sense is not really like you don't really have DNF inside it, so you cannot use it like a classic Fedora uh, container image. You you cannot really install packages in it right now. It's not supported, so it's not really meant like like a classic container image. It's more like a, a way to store things in it. And I think that's yeah. the last of the questions uh, we have right now. So feel free if you have any other questions to. Ask them. We still have something like four minutes to go, and otherwise we'll close this session. Yep, in chat, this said CoreOS Assembler seems like a great way to test your ignition changes before.
for applying them on a server. Yep. Uh, CoreOS Assembler has a nice feature of being able to do CoreOS Assembler run. And basically, the image that you just built, it'll start a virtual machine, and you can just jump right into it. You don't even have to SSH. It will SSH for you. Uh, and so you can provide your own ignition config and test it if you would want to. Or you can take the image that you built and run it anywhere else and uh, test it that way, too. So it's, it's a nice little uh, development and test environment. Okay, so I'll say thanks everyone for joining us today, and uh, we'll hopefully post the slides somewhere. You can uh, yeah, somewhere, and we'll post the links uh, either on the Fedora Core Tracker or inside. Uh, well, I don't know the shadows. Maybe I don't know where we can put them, but yeah, you should be able to find them so shortly, and we'll do that. And we'll we'll link them um, in the usual Fedora Core yep. places. I also. So I had a I had a slide at the very end which I managed to to not show, which I'll try to show now. Oh yeah, uh, which is more or less uh, how to get involved. Yes, it's basically how to get involved. So we have uh, a website where you can go download it. We have an issue tracker where you can report issues or you know have design discussions. We have a forum where you can just ask you know. I'm new to Fedora Core OS, or I'm hitting this problem. Is this an actual bug? Uh, mailing list for the same thing. We're in IRC. And then uh, there are links at the bottom, which I'm thinking these slides get posted somewhere eventually, um, to other previous talks where we go into a little more and do demos and such like that. So there's YouTube links at the bottom. Um, so yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming, and uh, appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully you're interested in Fedora Core OS and come chat with us, come uh, get involved and uh, enjoy the project. Thank you all. Thank you. See you.